At the height of the Galactic Civil War between the Empire and the Rebel Alliance, it was predicted that the Space Fleet of the Rebellion was only 7% of the existing Imperial Fleet. At the same time, the total number of Rebel troops was just 3.5% of the Empire's military forces. Of course, in light of the eventual Rebel victory, this staggering difference did not make victory impossible. For millennia, smaller forces had utilized the space warfare strategy, known as the Stateless Strategy, to defeat a larger, superior military. Like Thrawn and the Separatists, the Rebellion would utilize this strategy to great success. Additionally, given that the Rebellion didn't have to actually control territory across the galaxy, they could devote all of their resources into offensive operations, further overcoming their smaller numbers. But regardless of the Rebellion's stateless strategy, the overwhelming power of the Empire meant that the military doctrine of the Rebel Alliance had to be developed in a way that benefited its insurgency status when confronting the New Order. There was little room for error in their doctrine, and as we'll see, hard lessons had to be learned through disastrous campaigns that ultimately pushed the Rebellion towards victory. In this video expose, we'll look at the army doctrine developed by the Rebellion to wage war against the Empire, noting the disaster of its initial war plan and the evolution of its forces into one capable of confronting and defeating the Empire. In part 2 of this series, we'll look at the evolution of the Rebellion's fleet and Starfighter doctrine, where in many ways, the true battle between the Empire and Rebellion would be decided. Two years before the Battle of Yavin, a coalition was formed between the countless groups across the galaxy fighting in opposition to the tyranny of Emperor Palpatine. At the Corellian System meetings in 2 BBY, it was decided that the groups who'd formerly been connected through their opposition to the Empire would become a genuine alliance, fighting for a common goal of restoring the Republic and aiding each other in that effort. Given that these groups were literally spread across the galaxy and had yet to develop strong ties between them, the Rebellion promoted a doctrine that designated each local component of the Alliance as a Sector Force, or Sec Force. Although they now all fell under the umbrella of the Rebellion following the Corellian System meetings, there was little uniformity or common practice among the Sector Forces. Instead, each sector force was semi-autonomous from the rest of the Alliance, where each sect force was charged with focusing their efforts on resisting the Empire within their local sectors. This meant that each sector force differed widely in their roles, organization, and abilities. Some sector forces could be considered relatively strong and self-sufficient, having established their own local networks for fleets and ammunitions through years of resisting the Empire. On the other hand, many of the Sector Forces were poorly equipped, insufficiently trained, and consisted of no Space Forces. For the majority of these Sector Forces, the primary asset was solely Ground Forces. Nevertheless, Alliance High Command saw its position as the strongest it had ever been relative to the Empire. They now had thousands of Sector Forces across the galaxy, all dedicated to bringing down Palpatine and organized in a way where coordination could be carried out. Thus, the initial war plan of the Alliance aimed for exactly that, a coordinated show of revolt against the Empire all across the galaxy. Known as Operation Domino, this initial war plan was developed by the Alliance two years before the Battle of Yavin. It required the stronger sector forces to focus their ground units upon targeting the Imperial Army garrisons within their local sectors. After defeating the local Imperial Army garrisons, the ground troops of each sector force would then dig in behind their planetary shields and hold off the overwhelming Imperial Starfleet. These were designed to be showpiece battles that demonstrated the abilities of the Rebellion and show that the Empire could be put on the defensive and defeated. Most importantly, Operation Domino was a direct result of the Alliance's decision to organize and operate through the Sector Forces system. With each Sect Force focusing on their own system and achieving victories across the galaxy, the Rebellion hoped it would inspire revolution in every star system controlled by the Empire. Unfortunately, Operation Domino ended in a complete disaster for the Rebellion. In fact, in more systems than not, these sector forces suffered crushing defeats that would see many of them completely annihilated. Not only was there no galaxy-wide revolution, but many of the surviving sector forces had to flee their local systems, further reducing the perceived advantages of the sect force system and causing greater fear for others to take a step towards rebellion. 
The failure of Operation Domino taught Alliance High Command a valuable lesson that would be crucial in their ongoing war against the Empire. Although they were able to produce hundreds of loyal army brigades throughout the galaxy, it only truly amounted to part of an army. The Sector Force system was insufficient in ensuring that each local infantry unit possessed bases of operation, air, armor, munition, and technical support, or even the most basic of training. Therefore, Operation Domino would result in a massive evolution in Rebel Army Doctrine. A centralized army corps that answered to High Command was necessary. Fortunately, this conclusion coincided with one of the rare beneficial results coming out of the military disaster of Operation Domino. Although many of the sector forces would ultimately be crushed, the sacrifice that was made by these poorly equipped and trained rebels did create a wave of sympathy to permeate the ranks of the Imperial Army. Both during and following the campaign, many of the Empire's most decorated army officers defected to the rebel cause. Two notable examples were General Kryle and Commander Harles. Officers such as these helped to pick up the pieces of the decimated rebel units that survived Operation Domino, and began to reorganize them into what would become the Alliance Special Forces. Although the sector forces weren't abolished completely and would still perform operations within their local systems, the Alliance Special Forces, or Spec Force, would evolve to form the backbone of the rebellion and the defining feature of its army doctrine. Comprising roughly 100,000 soldiers that represented the most skilled, bravest, and dedicated within the rebellion and funneled in from the ranks of the sector forces, the Alliance Special Forces was a centralized army that answered to the Alliance High Command. The standards in every area of training were significant, and many of those who volunteered for recruitment ended up dropping out. Although every Spec Force candidate had already undergone both basic and specialist training previously, every recruit was required to go through an additional two months of weapons drills, where they would become proficient with blasters, heavy weaponry, hand-to-hand -hand combat, and slug throwers. They would also be given instruction in galactic military history. Spec Force also included specialized training, where following their basic Spec Force training, they attended further training in a specific skill that prepared them in an area of expertise. This was dependent upon their natural abilities and proficiencies and the needs of the Rebellion. Although Alliance Special Forces was organized into formal units consisting of divisions, regiments, companies, platoons, and squads, these were relatively meaningless when it came to the actual fighting done by Spec Force. Because resources were scarce, soldiers rarely conducted missions as full units. Instead, these ground soldiers were organized into task forces, where commanders would pick and choose the size of the unit and its composition depending upon the needs of the mission. As Alliance Special Forces evolved, these commanders could requisition soldiers that were specialized in ship-focused combat, urban combat, wilderness combat, infiltration, heavy weaponry, technical support, and special operations, giving the Rebellion the ability to create a temporary task force that could carry out a wide range of missions. Most importantly, the Rebellion now had the ability to support their sector forces in a way that would prevent another disastrous Operation Domino, by filling in the holes of these brigades with soldiers from Spec Force as needed. In only a few short months, the Army Doctrine of the Rebellion had gone through a paramount evolution. The Alliance now had the ability to train and coordinate its own centralized army. Instead of relying solely upon poorly trained and equipped local forces, the Rebellion could form temporary units of varying size and with diversified skills to buttress the weaknesses of these sector forces, and carry out necessary and difficult missions with a far greater degree of success. This evolution in the army doctrine of the Rebel Alliance ensured that it successfully waged war against the Empire. So there we have it, how the Rebel Army was able to fight the Empire despite their vast differences in size and power. We love making these videos, so why not subscribe for more fun Star Wars theories and discussions. Also, if you enjoyed the video, think about giving a like or leaving a comment. Or perhaps follow us on Twitter, at SWReadingClub, for updates regarding the channel. Or support the channel through Patreon, for access to exclusive rewards and discussions. If not for me... For the real evolution to come.